This is the Music Halls of Fame podcast. In honor of the 51st anniversary of hip-hop, we honor the year in music for 2009, along with a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 2009. We also make the case for putting OutKast into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, plus our Spotlight Museum is the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. Before we get going with the podcast, like everyone tells you, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you'll know when these podcast episodes drop, which is usually every Thursday. Now, on to this week's episode. The year was 2009. In music, the major story was the death of Michael Jackson. BET did a tribute to him, which was passable at best. It was overshadowed earlier in the day, though, when Michael's father, Joe, didn't talk about his son during the interviews, but instead pushed his own music project, because family love, you know. The MTV Video Music Awards also paid him a tribute with a performance by Janet Jackson and a speech by Madonna, but all of that was overshadowed by the now infamous Kanye interrupting Taylor Swift speech incident. Meanwhile, in 2009, Chris Brown was charged with assaulting Rihanna the night before the Grammy Awards. The concert Hussett Concert Hall opened in Copenhagen, Denmark. The inauguration of President Barack Obama drew star-studded music artist power to inauguration concerts and balls, including Beyonce, who got into trouble with singer Etta James, because Etta didn't like the fact that Beyonce performed Etta's classic At Last as the first dance song for the President and First Lady Michelle Obama. No one was quite sure what the beef was really about, perhaps because Etta James was another in a long line of artists who never got paid any money from other artists singing her songs, and probably figured that she should have been the one to do it. However, as you will see later, beef was the word of the year, and it wasn't just Etta versus Beyonce or Kanye versus Taylor or Rihanna versus Chris. The biggest album of the year in America was Taylor Swift's Fearless. The biggest album of the year worldwide, though, was by Britain's Got Talent contestant Susan Boyle. Other big albums were by U2, Lady Gaga, Eminem, Michael Buble, Andrea Bocelli, Jay-Z, The Black Eyed Peas, Kings of Leon, the Hannah Montana soundtrack, and three of Michael Jackson's albums, because death is always a great career move. You're just not around to enjoy the benefits, but your record label streaming services and your estate certainly are, aren't they? Hmm. Michael Jackson was the biggest selling artist of the year, selling 35 million copies of his albums worldwide right after his death, along with his documentary, This Is It, becoming the biggest documentary of all time at that point, making over $250 million in the process. 2009 was also Lady Gaga's coming out party, with three of the biggest hits of the year being Just Dance, Telephone, and Poker Face. The Black Eyed Peas also had a big year with Boom Boom Pow and also I Got a Feeling. Other best-selling singles of 2009 included Beyonce's Single Ladies, Taylor Swift's Love Story, and You Belong With Me, Flo Rida's Right Round, Jason Mraz's I'm Yours, Kanye's Heartless, and the All-American Rejects Give You Hell. In rock music, there were new albums by Nickelback, Franz Ferdinand, Lamb of God, U2, Newfound Glory, Silver Sun Pickups, The Tragically Hip, Depeche Mode, Green Day, Marilyn Manson, Grizzly Bear, The Manic Street Preachers, 311, Taking Back Sunday, Carnivool, Kasabian, Kill Switch Engage, All Time Low, Daughtry, The Dead Winter, Third Eye Blind, Skillet, Chevelle, The Used, Pearl Jam, Three Days Grace, Muse, Five Finger Death Punch, Paramore, Breaking Benjamin, Alice in Chains with new lead singer William Duvall, Creed, Them Cooked Vultures, Snow Patrol, Weezer, plus solo albums from Rob Thomas of Matchbox 20 and Chris Cornell with his last solo album. 
In the UK, there was a campaign to get Rage Against the Machine song Killing in the Name of to the top of the UK pop charts during Christmas week. It's called the Christmas number one, and it's a big tradition that is normally dominated by some sugary sweet pop song from the winner of the TV show X Factor that immediately gets forgotten once Christmas is over. Go ahead, name one. I'll wait. Wait's over. Dara, you can't. Sorry. It is literally cotton candy. The campaign this time around, however, worked, and Killing in the Name of was the number one song in the UK for Christmas, making X Factor host and producer Simon Cowell very unhappy, and technically now making Killing in the Name of a Christmas song. Technically. In country music, Garth Brooks came out of his self-imposed exile to start a five-year Las Vegas residency. Big albums were released by Brad Paisley, Miranda Lambert, Martina McBride, Tim McGraw, Carrie Underwood, Toby Keith, Keith Urban, the Hannah Montana movie soundtrack, and two greatest hits albums from Kenny Chesney and Brooks and Dunn. Having big hit singles in 2009 were Taylor Swift's You Belong With Me, Sugar Land's Already Gone, Lady Antebellum's I Run To You, Kenny Chesney's Out Last Night, Toby Keith's God Love Her, Darius Rucker's It Won't Be Like This For Long, Jason Aldean's Big Green Tractor, Alan Jackson's Country Boy, Carrie Underwood's Cowboy Casanova, Rascal Flatts's Here Comes Goodbye, George Strait's River of Love, Blake Shelton's She Wouldn't Be Gone, Keith Urban's Only You Could Love Me This Way, and the Zac Brown Band's Toes. In hip-hop, it was the year of beef, as you had beef with 50 Cent vs. Rick Ross, Beanie Siegel and 50 Cent vs. Jay-Z, Method Man vs. Joe Budden, Young Jeezy vs. DJ Drama, Trina vs. Kia, and Soldier Boy vs. Bow Wow. All of these guys decided to go at it because no one learned from the Tupac Biggie beef about how things can get violent quickly. For instance, Joe Budden was physically attacked by Method Man's fellow Wu-Tang Clan member, Raekwon, a few months after this whole beef started between them. Bunch of idiots. Ending beef, thankfully, that year were The Game versus 50 Cent. Meanwhile, Soldier Boy tried to end his beef with The New Boys. Don't think that worked out too well. Musically, Drake released his mixtape So Far Gone, which had Best I Ever Had on it. Eminem's Crack a Bottle and Flo Rida's Right Round both hit number one, but the biggest and probably most enduring hip-hop song from 2009 was Jay-Z and Alicia Keys' New York City anthem, Empire State of Mind. Other hits included Jay-Z and Rihanna's Run This Town, Fabulous's Throw It in the Bag, Kanye's Heartless, Lil Wayne's Prop Queen, T.I.'s Dead and Gone, and Kid Cudi's Day and Night. Big albums that year were released by Eminem, Jay-Z, 50 Cent, Rick Ross, Young Money, Jada Kiss, Kid Cudi, Fabulous, Gucci Mane, and UGK. EDM started to become more mainstream, mainly due to David Guetta helping to produce the Black Eyed Peas songs, while his song with Kelly Rowland, When Love Takes Over, made way for other artists to want to work with EDM producers, which all led to the EDM explosion only a couple of years later. Big EDM albums included Dead Mouses, for lack of a better name, Major Lazer's Guns Don't Kill People, Lasers Do, the Prodigy's Invaders Must Die, Calvin Harris's Ready for the Weekend, and Moby's Wait for Me. Other dance hits, besides the Black Eyed Peas I Got a Feeling and Boom Boom Pow, were Cascade's Move for Me, Dizzy Rascal's Dirty Cash, LaRoe's Bulletproof, Axwell and Engrosso's Leave the World Behind, Dead Mouse's EDM classic Ghosts and Stuff, Cascada's Evacuate the Dance Floor, Fetty Legrand's influential dance track, Put Your Hands Up for Detroit, I Love This City, David Guetta's Memories, and Sexy Bitch, that was the song with Akon, Boys Noise Jeffer, Christine W's Be Alright, and Lady Gaga, who actually owned the dance floor with her three big hits. 
The top 10 DJs on DJ Mag's Top 100 DJs poll for the year were Armin Van Buren, Tiesto, David Guetta, Above and Beyond, Paul Van Dyke, Dead Mouse, Ferry Corsten, Marcus Schultz, Gareth Emery, and Sander Van Dorn. In Latin music, the biggest artists of the year included Aventura, who had the biggest album, Banda El Rocodo, who had the biggest single, Wizen y Yandel, Luis Fonzi, Vicente Fernandez, Daddy Yankee, El Trono de Mexico, Nesti, Ricardo Orjonia, and Tito El Bambino. On May 12, 2009, at a White House event celebrating poetry, Lin-Manuel Miranda tried out an idea he had by rapping about Alexander Hamilton. The response that he received inspired him to flesh out his idea some more, and that idea became, of course, the blockbuster Broadway sensation Hamilton, which came to Broadway in 2015. Meanwhile on Broadway, the 2009-2010 Broadway season was the first season that total box office grossed over $1 billion. Musicals or revivals of musicals that opened in 2009 included 9 to 5, the musical, Bye Bye Birdie, Fella, about Fella Kuti, Guys and Dolls, Irving Berlin's White Christmas, Hair, Memphis, the musical, Rock of Ages, and West Side Story. Musical films that came out in 2009 included Hannah Montana, the movie, Nine, Notorious, Alvin and the Chipmunks, the Squeakquel, a remake of the movie Fame, and the animated Disney movie The Princess and the Frog. Bands who formed in 2009 included the Alabama Shakes, AWOL Nation, Basement, Diddy Dirty Money, Duck Sauce, Foster the People, Icona Pop, 21 Pilots, Macklemore and Ryan Lewis, Nick Jonas and the Organization, and Zed's Dead. Bands that broke up in 2009 before, of course, their inevitable reunions or announced their hiatus for one reason or another, including a member's death, included All Saints, Love and Rockets, Live, Blue Cheer, Danity Kane, Divinals, EMF, Oasis, after yet more beef between the Gallagher brothers, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Fall Out Boy, The Pussycat Dolls, Hanoi Rocks, The Verve, Violent Femmes, Stereo Lab, and Escape. Bands that either reunited or came back from extended breaks included the Bee Gees, Blink-182, Cinderella, Creed, Capone, Noriega, The Cranberries, Faith No More, House of Pain, Johnny Hates Jazz, Limp Biscuit, Method Man and Red Man, Mott the Hoople, Mr. Big, Fish, The Plastic Ono Band, Public Image Limited, Skunk Anansi, Spandau Ballet, Wang Chung, Sublime, and The Jacksons. Aside from Michael Jackson, other major music deaths included guitarist Ron Ashton of the Stooges, guitar great and manufacturer Les Paul, DJ AM Billy Powell of Leonard Skinner, singer Dan Seals, former basketball player and jazz man Wayman Tisdale, blues great Coco Taylor, singer Al Martino, Avenged Sevenfold founder The Rev, singer Vic Chestnut, singer Carla Boney, singer Stephen Gately of Boyzone, singer Taylor Mitchell, singer Mercedes Sosa, DJ Rock Raider, singer Willie DeVille, drummer Uriel Jones of Motown Session House Band The Funk Brothers, Randy Kane of The Delphonics, Bob Bogle of The Ventures, rapper Dalla, Steve Ferguson of NRBQ, opera singer She Pay Poo, the father of Latin Boogaloo, Mr. Joe Cuba, Singer Vern Gosden, composer Maurice Jarre, singer Alain Bachung, singer Hank Lachlan, Lux Interior of the Cramps, Dewey Martin of Buffalo Springfield, and Mary Travers of Peter, Paul, and Mary. In awards for the music of 2009, at the Grammy Awards, Taylor Swift's Fearless won Album of the Year, making her, at the age of 20, the youngest winner of the award until Billie Eilish destroyed that record a decade later. Record of the Year went to Kings of Leon for the song Use Somebody. Beyonce won Song of the Year for Single Ladies, and the Zac Brown Band won Best New Artist. At the MTV Video Music Awards, Beyonce won Video of the Year for Single Ladies, although, as mentioned before, Kanye stole the show and not in a good way. By the way, when Beyonce won the award, since she had won awards 
earlier that evening. She invited Taylor Swift to come up on stage to actually finish the speech that Kanye interrupted. At the American Music Awards, Taylor Swift won Artist of the Year. Beyonce won Album of the Year at the Soul Train Music Awards. The Billboard Music Awards weren't held that year. They would start back up in 2011. Lady Gaga's Born This Way won Favorite Album, and Katy Perry and Kanye's song E.T. won Favorite Song at the People's Choice Awards. Taylor Swift won Entertainer of the Year at the Country Music Association Awards and also won the exact same award at the Academy of Country Music Awards. Florence and the Machine won Best British Album for Lungs and JLS won Best Song for Beat Again at the Brit Awards. During that ceremony, Iron Maiden became the first heavy metal act to win a Brit Award when they won the Best Live Act Award. Kanan won Artist of the Year, Michael Bublé's Crazy Love won Best Album, while Michael's song Haven't Met You Yet won Best Song at the Juno Awards. Empire of the Sun won Album of the Year for Walking on a Dream, and they also won Song of the Year for Walking on a Dream at the Aria Music Awards. At the Eurovision Singing Contest, which was held in Moscow that year, Alexander Ryback from Norway won for the song Fairy Tale. At the Tony Awards, Billy Elliot the Musical won Best Musical, and Hair won Best Revival of a Musical. Steve Reich's piece, Double Sex Tech, won the Pulitzer Prize for Music. For Academy Award Music Categories, Soundtrack for Up won Best Film Score, and The Weary Kind from Crazy Heart won Best Song. Speech to Bill won the Mercury Music Prize, becoming the first woman in seven years to win the award. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony took place on April 4th at Public Auditorium in, for the very first time in 12 years, Cleveland, Ohio. It was also the first time that the public were allowed to buy tickets to the event. At the ceremony, bass guitarist Bill Black, drummer DJ Fontana, and keyboardist Spooner Oldham were inducted into the Sidemen category. It was the final year of the Sidemen category, as the category was expanded upon in 2010 and became the Award for Musical Excellence category. In the Early Influencers category, the Hall inducted Wanda Jackson. In the Performers category, the Hall inducted Jeff Beck, Metallica, Bobby Womack, Little Anthony and the Imperials, and this next group. The original nicknames to this group were DJ Run, son of Curtis Blow, Easy D, and Jazzy Jace. In the early 1980s, though, they were three kids who grew up in Hollis, Queens. Joseph Simmons had an older brother named Russell, who was a hip-hop promoter and had started a record label with his college roommate, Rick Rubin, called Def Jam Records. Russell, at the time, promoted rapper Curtis Blow and needed someone to be Curtis's DJ. Joseph was recruited to be that DJ, and soon, Joseph actually wanted to rap. Russell let Joseph record one song, which went absolutely nowhere. In the meantime, Joseph had a friend named Daryl McDaniel. The two of them wanted to rap as a duo. At first, Russell said no because he didn't like Daryl's rap style, but eventually he said yes. They needed a DJ, though, so they got their friend Jason Mazel. Russell then changed their nicknames. Joseph DJ Run, son of Curtis Blow, became Run. Daryl Easy D became DMC. And Jason Jazzy Jace became Jam Master J. And the group became known as Run DMC. For the record, they hated the name of the group, but it grew on them. They signed to Profile Records and released their first single called It's Like That. The song hit number 15 on the Billboard R&B charts. And after that success, they released their first album, Run DMC, in 1984. That album had hits like Hard Times. It also had the transcending song Rock Box. With a mixture of hip-hop and hard rock, complete with the blistering guitar of session musician Eddie Paul Martinez, the song was one of the first to combine what were, at least at that point in life, two separate worlds, black inner-city hip-hop 
and white heavy metal. Both were considered dangerous in the eyes of the mainstream, which made them a perfect combination for kids like me. 1985 was a big year for the group from a career perspective. First, they released their next album, King of Rock, which further solidified their sound with the songs King of Rock and Can You Rock It Like This. They were then the only hip-hop act to perform at Live Aid. They followed that up with an appearance in the hit movie Crush Groove. 1986 saw their biggest success with one of the most important albums of the 1980s, Raising Hell. The album was produced by Rick Rubin, who had a major role in one of the most important songs of all time, at least in terms of pop music. The album was almost done when they decided to do one more song to pique interest from their fans who liked the hard rock sounds of King of Rock and Rockbox. After some discussion, they fell upon the idea of doing Walk This Way by Aerosmith, with Howie Weinberg as the mastering engineer on the track. Originally, they were going to sample the song, but Rick and Jam Master Jay wanted to redo the song completely. They put out the call to Aerosmith to gauge interest. At first, there wasn't any. What has to be remembered is that in 1985, no one liked Aerosmith. Known as the Toxic Twins at that point, Aerosmith's Steven Tyler and Joe Perry were looked at as part of a group whose heyday was in the 1970s and had a lot of drugs, alcohol, and other internal band issues. They were, at that point, pretty much done as a band. Even with their careers in freefall, though, Steven and Joe still didn't want to do the song because, honestly, they hated hip-hop. To them, and a lot of other artists, hip-hop was taking their songs, using them without paying the artists, and making money off of them. And the Toxic Twins wanted no part of it. Absolutely, in terms of complete honesty, they were right. Hip-hop was actually doing that. Rick, however, convinced them to come to the studio to work things out. Once they saw how Jam Master Jay would cut the record precisely where he wanted the beat to be at will on the turntables, they were fascinated, and then they wanted in on the collaboration. The music video also became iconic. That video unfolds with both acts on opposite sides of a wall, then once Run DMC starts rapping loud to the beat, Steven breaks through the wall with a mic stand. Then everybody ends up on a concert stage together as a show of solidarity, breaking down the barriers between both the rock and hip-hop cultures. They sing Kumbaya. Okay, maybe they didn't go that far, but you get the point. Rumor has it that Steven couldn't actually break down the wall at first, but they left that part in the final cut. The song, the album, and the music video all became big hits, along with becoming icons of 80s music. It also gave Aerosmith their career back as the band got back together and started putting out hit songs like Love in an Elevator, Dude Looks Like a Lady, Angel, Jaded, Don't Want to Miss a Thing, among many, many others, in what can only be described as one of the greatest musical comebacks in rock music history. Unfortunately, Aerosmith have had to now officially retire from touring as Steven Tyler's vocal cords are now ripped beyond repair, unfortunately. As for this version of the song Walk This Way, it was released on July 4, 1986 in America and went top 10 in 13 different countries. It never hit number one in America, only going to number four on the Billboard Hot 100 singles chart. It hit number eight on the Billboard R&B Hip Hop chart, which was delightfully called the Hot Black chart back then because, well, because corporations were pretty insulting and a little bit on the racist side back then. That's why. It was the 89th biggest single of 1986 and sold over one million copies in America. It also won a ton of awards, including Best Rap Single at the Soul Train Music Awards, and of course has ended up on many different best of lists, regardless of genre. The music video has also been cited as one of the greatest music videos of all time on more than a few best of lists. I don't know if the music video was one of the best, that might be a stretch, but it and the song were definitely important. 
you have to remember the times. It was the 1980s, especially the early to mid-1980s. Black kids had their music, white kids had their music, and never the twain shall meet, except for geeky music kids like me who grew up on almost everything and loved everything. Rap music at the time was looked at as dangerous and pissed off everybody in the mainstream. What Run DMC did was to combine rock and rap music so that common ground was met between the races, at least for the Gen X kids like me. Run DMC were by no means the first artists to combine rap and rock music, but they were one of the first to break through to the mainstream with it, so they usually get credit more than likely because of the music video being so popular. It was an extremely important rung on the ladder to global acceptance for hip-hop as the Beastie Boys made rap music popular with the suburban kids and for better or worse, mainly worse, MC Hammer and Vanilla Ice watered down rap music enough to make suburban parents love it. Well, at least some of them. NWA, Ice-T, Public Enemy, and Body Count still scared the hell out of the parents. Seriously scared the hell out of the parents. We actually go over all of that, especially NWA with Straight Outta Compton, on this particular week's Music History In-Depth podcast. I'll put in a plug for that right here and now. That one has already dropped. You should find it and like it and subscribe to that as well. It's a great podcast. It's on this channel, by the way. In any event, after the success of Raising Hell, Run DMC put out Tougher Than Leather and Down With The King, but by then, the sound that the group had pioneered had already changed, and so did they. Run became a minister, while Jay became a producer, producing the group Onyx, who had the hit song Slam. The three guys started to not get along with each other, and they started to go in different directions musically. In 2002, Jay was shot and killed in his studio in Queens, New York. His murder was finally solved almost 20 years later. In their career, Run DMC released seven studio albums, one live album, and six compilation albums. Of those, nine hit the top 40 on the American charts, with three of those nine going top 10, including two of the three, Raising Hell and 1993's Down With The King, both going to number one. They also released 30 singles of those. 16 hit the top 40 on the American charts, with four of those 16 going top 10. Run DMC was one of the most influential hip-hop groups of all time. They influenced later rap rock acts like Korn, Kid Rock, Limp Bizkit, The Prodigy, and others. They were the first hip-hop act to appear on Dick Clark's American Bandstand TV show, the first hip-hop act to earn a gold record for their self-titled debut album, the first hip-hop act to earn a platinum record with King of Rock. They were also the first hip-hop act to earn a multi-platinum album with Raising Hell. They were the first hip-hop group to get played on MTV, and they were the first hip-hop act to be nominated for a Grammy Award. Presented for induction by Class of 2022 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee Eminem, Joseph Rev Run Simmons, Daryl DMC McDaniels, Jason Jam Master J. Mizell. Run, run, DMC. Inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Class of 2009. And we have put their greatest hits album onto this week's podcast playlist, the link to which is in the show notes. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you that there is now a Music History In-Depth podcast where we go more in-depth on a few of the events that happened in music history for that particular week. The Music History In-Depth podcast drops every Tuesday on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts from, as does our Music History Today podcast, which goes over the daily events in music history. The Music History Today podcast drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. <music> This week, we're going to look at the case for putting Atlanta duo Outcast into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So, as we always do, to the tale of the tape we go. 
Outkast released six studio albums and one compilation album. Of those, all of them hit the top five on the American charts, with all of the studio albums hitting either number one or number two. All of their albums went platinum, with five of them going multi-platinum. Their 2003 album, Speaker Box, The Love Below, sold 13 million copies and was the first hip-hop album to win a Grammy Award for Best Album. Outkast also released 32 singles. Of those, 14 hit the top 40 on the American charts, with 11 of those 14 going top 10, including 5 hitting number 1. They also had hit singles like Hey Ya, Bombs Over Baghdad, Rosa Parks, Miss Jackson, So Fresh and So Clean, The Way You Move, and Roses. Outkast was nominated for five American Music Awards, winning four of them, 16 Grammy Awards, winning six of those, including the aforementioned Album of the Year one in 2004, and eight MTV Video Music Awards, winning five of those. When you talk about Southern hip-hop, you cannot talk about it without talking about Outkast. They're the ones who put Southern hip-hop on the map. What they did, which went beyond what even other Southern hip-hop artists did, was that they experimented with different sounds like R&B, funk, rock, jazz, and even a little EDM. In fact, they were one of the first hip-hop acts to embrace EDM and rave culture in their music. Their albums were always different and original. They haven't recorded together since the 2006 album Idol Wind, and their heyday was from 1994 to 2003, but their influence on Southern hip-hop is immeasurable. They broke down the door for other Southern acts to follow. As for whether Outkast belongs in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the answer is yes. They've been eligible since 2019. Two of their albums are on Rolling Stone Magazine's 500 Greatest Albums of All Time list, regardless of genre. You would think that alone should get them in. You would also think that being the standard bearer for Southern hip-hop would get them in. Yet, they probably won't get in without at least trying to do well in the fan vote. The reason? Well, because it's hip-hop. The Hall members don't usually put all that many acts in, even ones who should obviously get in. And even when they do, it's usually only one artist per year. There have been a couple exceptions to that. The exceptions being 2021, when Jay-Z and LL Cool J both went in, and in 2023, when DJ Cool Herc and Missy Elliott both went in. I don't think that the fan vote will help, as hip-hop acts usually end up at the bottom of the fan votes. I'm not even sure that they're going to get in in the next few years. But, Outkast certainly deserves to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and to prove it, we're going to put their biggest hits onto this week's podcast playlist. The link is in the show notes. This week's Spotlight Museum is the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. The museum is located on the National Mall, right across the street from the Washington Monument and a few blocks away from the White House. The museum highlights the experience and contributions of African Americans to specifically America, but more broadly the world. A lot of the museum deals with slavery and civil rights. There's a slave cabin, an airplane that was flown by the member of the Tuskegee Airmen, as well as items pertaining to the military, religion, literature, and politics, along with sports. The museum also has an extensive collection of artifacts concerning music. The museum boasts Chuck Berry's pink Cadillac, stage costumes worn by Parliament Funkadelic and others, along with other recordings, sheet music, photos, and such. And there's also a great online resource on their website, where they put a lot of their collection online for you to look at. The museum is open daily from 10 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Admission is free. After all, your tax dollars paid for it. However, the only way that you can walk into the museum without a pass is if you show your military ID. 
Otherwise, you either have to try to get timed passes in the mornings that you want to go, which run out very quickly, I might add, or you can get passes in advance online. Check the museum's website, nmaahc.si.edu, for information about the timed passes, along with that collection I was just talking about. And yes, we are going to put that link in the show notes so you didn't have to grab a pen and try and copy it. In the museum's archives is an extensive photography collection of hip-hop historian and former Def Jam Records publicist Bill Adler. Bill amassed what can only be described as the largest and most important photo collection of hip-hop artists and culture of the 20th century. It has over 400 photographs covering hip-hop from the early 1980s to the early part of the 21st century. This collection comes on the heels of the museum's 9-CD and coffee table book box set on the history of hip-hop, along with photos and music from artists such as LL Cool J. The museum also has items from this pioneer. On August 11, 1973, there was a party held in the basement of 1520 Sedgwick Avenue in the Bronx, New York, about a mile away from Yankee Stadium, give or take. It was to celebrate a girl's birthday. Like most kids who have parties, the first thing you do is you get your friends and family to help throw it, and this girl, of course, was no different. It just so happened that this girl got her brother to DJ the party. The brother, Clive Campbell, a.k.a. DJ Cool Herc, was born on April 16, 1955 in Kingston, Jamaica. He spent his first years growing up in Jamaica, but his family moved to the Bronx, New York, and when he got a little older. As he went out to parties and learned how to become a DJ, he noticed something about the way the DJ spun their records. They would do what was called a call and response and talk over the records at certain points. He also noticed that people would come out to dance mainly during the parts of the songs where the drums kicked in, otherwise known as the drum break, in order to try out their new dance moves. So he had an idea. What if he took the drum part of the song and made it longer? He worked on the idea with two turntables and a microphone, put the same record on both turntables so that while one was playing, he could use the other one to go back to the point of the song that he needed to get to, sometimes scratching the record in order to do it. He called this trick the merry-go-round. Finally, on August 11th, 1973, at the age of 18, Herc brought his invention out into the public in front of his biggest crowd to date at that time, his sister's birthday party. He threw up two copies of a James Brown record onto the turntable. The crowd figured that he would do a transition between the records. Instead, he did his merry-go-round trick. These days, it's known as the breakbeat. The crowd went wild, and soon, word spread of the new style and people started copying it. Some started rapping over it, and soon the organic style of music first known as rap and now known as hip-hop took its first major steps. It all started in the Bronx on August 11, 1973, when the kid's brother, DJ Cool Herc, took two turntables and a microphone and helped to invent not only a new style of music, but also helped to change world music along with youth and street culture. It has been banned. It has been ridiculed. It has been the subject of many, many racial attacks. It has incurred many a conservative's wrath. It has been legislated against, and some of its creators, like Public Enemy, 2 Live Crew, and NWA, have even been declared enemies of the state and worse. Yet, through it all, the attempted cancellations and cries of quote-unquote wokeness because of various culture wars over the decades, it has not only survived, but it has thrived, much like the culture and the people who it came from. Happy 51st anniversary, hip-hop, and thank you, DJ Cool Herc. We couldn't have done it without you, quite literally. 
You can see the photos and learn more about the legendary DJ Cool Herc in the archives of the Smithsonian National Museum for African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. The Music Halls of Fame podcast is part of the Music History Today network, which can be found under Music History Today on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts from and also on our YouTube page under Music History Today. Thank you very much for listening.